Great to be here in the building online as well. It's fantastic to have people joining us. And um, we've been looking at encounters with Jesus. And each week we've been uh, digging into a gospel story where Jesus meets someone. Um, and we, we sort of see something of Jesus' character um, and something about of the theology of Jesus. Who is Jesus? Each and every week we've been packing it, unpacking it more and more. And I'm really excited today to be talking about Nathaniel. Um, Nathaniel is uh, someone who's not mentioned very often in the Bible. Um, but we have this story of someone who is originally quite skeptical of Jesus, who's convinced to identify him as the son of God by the end of the conversation. And uh, we see someone who's skeptical, who then becomes inquisitive and then converted. Um, And it starts with just three words, come and see. So my testimony is that when I was uh, 17, 18, um, I I came to faith. Uh, Before then, I considered myself as sort of agnostic atheist. Um, I'd grown up in, um, in the Catholic church and kind of really not... Not, not found that very fun, if I'm honest, and, and sort of struggled with that a little bit. I went to Catholic primary school, and, and I sort of, I, I was quite sort of cynical about religion. I kind of felt that it was just there to sort of control me, to make me feel guilty. Um, I, I kind of got that Jesus was, had died for, and for me, and I kind of understood that concept. But what I took out of it was that Jesus has died for me, therefore I should probably feel bad, because all the bad things I've done meant that he got really nasty treatment, and that's my fault. Um, and and I kind of, that was the way I interpreted religion. I thought, I don't want any of that. I don't want any of that guilt. I don't want any of that shame. So I just sort of like left it. And I, and I kind of just started questioning. And I sort of, I just want to say, I saw myself as quite cynical about religion. I didn't really see it as uh, something that would affect my life. Um, but then when I was 17, 18, a friend said, why don't you come to church um, and just come and see what it's like? And it was a different type of church. It was a little bit similar to this one, but not, not completely. Um, and I, I, you know what? I just thought, well, I guess I'll have to go. It's my friend. He's a good friend. I should probably go and see it. Um, And I can dig into the rest of the story later. But I don't know about you. Have you ever been cynical about something? So much so that you just couldn't contemplate um, exploring it. You couldn't contemplate even seeing it. Um, I I was... um, I must admit, over lockdown, we we watched far too much television in our household. Um, You know, Disney Plus coming out was not a good thing for us. Um, But we did find... um, we really loved sort of 20-minute comedies. Um, anything too drama was just too intense. We weren't, we weren't for that. We wanted a little bit of fun. Um, but I, we ran out of them. We ran out of things that we really liked. And I am not a fan of Ricky Gervais. I, I, I must admit, I, 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 find, I kind of get a bit tired of him. Um, I'm not a fan of The British Office. And this might upset a few people. Um, and so... The thought and concept of the American office, to me, just felt like, no, no way. Um, Americans are not as funny as we are, um, so they can't... Um, that's, sorry, that's a bit of prejudice coming through. Um, it, they can't, it can't be a, that good of a show. But you know what? We've run out of everything, and we thought, fine, we'll just try it. And people had warned us, season one's a bit rubbish, season two's okay, so start on season two. And you know what? It was amazing. It's so funny. I am 100% converted. Absolutely love it. Seen it all. Um, would happily watch it again. In fact, we are re-watching it um, and absolutely loving it. Um, but just like I dismissed the American office, uh, Nathaniel dismisses Jesus in this passage. Um, he says this in verse 46, Nazareth, can anything good come from there. What is Nathaniel's problem? Why, why is he so concerned that absolutely nothing good could come from Nazareth? And why is it that, uh, that he is, just doesn't believe that Jesus is at all good um, because he's from there? Well, in verse 45, I think we see a little bit of, of what, what sets this up. And Philip, when he finds Nathaniel, he says to him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. You might be familiar with the context of the time that the Jewish people, um, Israel, was under sort of subjugation by the Romans. The Romans had taken over and they had been, um, they'd been taking resources, taking money, um, restricting the freedom of the Jews. And for the Jews, the pressing need of the time was to escape the Roman rule. And in their scripture, in, the, in, their, uh, in their holy books, the, the books that we call the Old Testament, there is prophecies that speak of a freedom that 
that is coming, of a person, a Messiah, um, sort of somebody who will bring that freedom, who will bring a change. Um, and they, would in, they interpreted it that someone was coming to th- overthrow the Romans. And, um, and what it looked like to him was what he saw the Romans do. He, he probably, in that time, they would, have, they would have sensed that a sort of powerful king was coming, a new king that perhaps had an army behind him and a white horse or whatever to ride on, so a, a stallion to ride on, probably not a white horse, um, but a stallion to ride on that would say, right, we're going to overthrow them by power. And so Nathaniel, when when. Philip says to him, I found that person. In his head, he's thinking, how can someone from like a little village town in the middle of Galilee, in the middle of nowhere pretty much, how, is, how have they got an army? How, have, how are they going to bring the change? How are they the one that's been talked about in the scriptures? And his mind is made up before he even comes to see who Jesus is. And you know what? I, I think there's quite a lot of this around today. There's a lot of tribalism, perhaps in our politics, um, in our sort of social structures, our, even where we're from, from the north or the south, um, big up the Midlands, that's neither. Um, but we also have our echo chambers on social media, so we, we kind of get entrenched in our views a little bit. And there, it's very rare for really healthy and good debate and discussion to happen um, in society today. And I'm... Um, I think for some today, when they think about Christianity, uh, for them, Christianity is a lot like Nazareth. You know, they roll their eyes. They think, oh, Jesus, gosh, (laughs) nothing good can come from that. Oh, oh, Christianity, oh, no, I've been there, done that. No, rubbish. And they're skeptical. And there's this sort of, this sense that actually, like, if you want to talk about that, um, let's not have a discussion. Let's not have a debate. Um, But you know what? I'm seeing that less and less. I think there's more and more people who are open, people who are seeking. And now, let me get this straight. Cynicism, um, which I think is what I've just what I've just sort of uh, just sort of expressed, is not the same as critical thinking. So, being sort of purposefully sceptical and just discarding the enemy, uh, sort of the opposition view, um, is very different to critically analysing, critically thinking things through. You see, I think it's really important that we engage with faith. So Nathaniel coming to Jesus, is he's thinking critically, maybe a little bit cynically, um, but he's, he's thinking critically, actually, what, who is this person? And it's good to be critical of everything, of things that come towards us. It's not good to just be taken by the latest fad or the newest thing. We want to be, uh, we want to be, thinking, okay, actually, what is in front of us here? What does this mean? Um, But we also, we want to make sure we are open-minded. We haven't closed our minds off. And there's this quote that seems to be attributed to absolutely everybody, if you look on Google. Um, But it says this, let's keep our minds open by all means, but not so open that our brains fall out. Uh, we want to make sure that we keep keep thinking about the things that are in front of us. And so, um, Critical thinking, to me, is like a healthy pursuit. It's almost like an active thing. And you want to think about things. You want to go towards things. Whereas cynicism, I think, is kind of a habitual passiveness towards things. It's like, actually, I don't want a part of that. I don't want to engage with it. I want to sort of remove myself from it. And what we see in this scripture is that Nathaniel, he puts down some of his pride, some of his prejudices, his cynicism, and he opens himself up to Jesus. For us, in our sort of critical thinking, I would encourage us to take our issues to God. Ask people about them. Um, take, take your doubts, your questions, the things that you're wrestling with to Jesus. You know, this is why um, Alpha, I would say, is a fantastic thing. The invitation is to come and see just like Philip uh, does to Nathaniel. He says, come and see. And people come and see, and they get to know Jesus in a new way through Alpha. They get to understand something, but they get to bring their questions too. You know, too often we mistake cynicism with questioning. (coughs) That's my cold, sorry. Um, Sometimes we might think, oh, I've got this hang up. And we, we think that we're being questioning when actually we're just disregarding something out of hand. But I would encourage you, that the issues that have been going on for you, the things that have come up over the last year and a half, perhaps it's, perhaps it's things that the church has done um, in its history. Um, perhaps it's things about justice that you just can't contemplate. Maybe it's about the pain and suffering that you've seen around you. Bring these issues to Jesus. There's 
2,000 years of thinking that the church has been doing on all of these issues. There is answers out there. And I would encourage you that Jesus, that God is not afraid of your questions, of your doubts. Find a Philip who can say, this is where to look. Come and see. So why did Nathaniel come and see? Well, I think it's because he couldn't find the answers anywhere else. In John 6, we hear Peter say, to whom would we go if we didn't go to you, Jesus? The answers are in Jesus. But when we come to Jesus, Jesus meets us in those those critical points, those things we don't understand. And then he surpasses those expectations. And that's my first point this morning, that Jesus surpassed, this morning, this evening, he surpasses our expectations. And there's this weird moment where Jesus welcomes Nathaniel. I don't know if you saw it. And it's like, it's, it's kind of like, you know, in James Bond, where it's like, I've been expecting you, Nathaniel. Um, where he's like, here truly is an, is an Israelite in whom there is no falsehood or there is no deceit or there is no guile, it says in other translations. And it's like a weird kind of like, I was expect, like a weird like moment where they kind of lock eyes and it's like, I haven't seen you before. Um, and for us, it's like, what is Jesus saying? What is he on about? And Nathaniel's like, how do you know me? And uh, I, I think here, where, which is a reference to in all of this story, um, it is a throwback to Jacob, the story of Jacob in Genesis 27 um, and onwards. And if you don't know about Jacob, go and check out um, that story in the Bible, um, where Jacob, he is known as deceitful. He, he was thought of as somebody who had deceit. Um, but Je- so when, 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 they, when Jesus uses this word and says that there is no deceit, there's no falsehood, immediately they would be thinking of the de- this deceiver, the one who has deceived. And that's Jacob, because Jacob, through deceit, stole the blessing from his brother Esau. But... Jacob becomes Israel. And Jacob is the one who the, who the blessing is going to come from. He's going to, the nation that is going to be born from his offspring is going to bless the nations. And so when Nathaniel is thinking, okay, well, what about this blessing, this prosperity that was promised through all those prophets and those Old Testament scriptures, um, those things that are on my heart, what, how are they going to be solved? And, and when Jesus says, you're, you don't have to see in you. He's saying, Jacob, Jacob, Jacob's blessing. And he's pinpointing it. And he's saying, this is the issue. And he meets Nathaniel in the issue that he's dealing with when he comes to Jesus. But then he goes on to surpass his expectation. You see, my story was that I, I, I expected Jesus to be the person who makes me feel guilty, the one who wants me to feel rubbish about myself. And when I came to faith, when I came back to church and I started exploring faith and I, I, I opened up my sort of heart a little bit and dropped a bit of that cynicism and I just said, actually, maybe there could be a God. Well, you know where Jesus met me? He met me in that on that issue. And he said, no, it's not about guilt. It's not about condemnation. It's about forgiveness and freedom and grace. You are completely forgiven in me. You know, Nathaniel, when he comes with all this cynicism and this sort of smug, critical thinking that he's got, he scoffs at Jesus at the beginning. But by the end of it, he's proclaiming him as his Lord. You know, I often think that in, in, when churches, people expect churches to be dead and boring. And when they walk past um, sort of a closed church where there's perhaps, I don't know, 10 people that meet there and it needs a bit of work on the outside or it's just closed completely, they think actually that's, a, that's an old castle of a forgotten king that has no relevance, no importance and means nothing to my life. Um, but what difference would it make if we in this city of Bristol, just as we reopen this building, we, we brought new churches, new communities to life, wouldn't that go way past the expectations of what people think of Jesus? Wouldn't they think, actually, if they looked in the doors and they saw hundreds of people, just like here tonight, we often get people poking their head in that door when we've got it open, and, and they say, they look in and they're thinking, wow, 
is, is this a church? Is this a church? Are people, do people have faith nowadays? Is Jesus alive? They start to wonder those questions. Wouldn't it be amazing if we started to see more of that in Bristol? Jesus exceeds our expectations. My second point is that Jesus sees us. In verse 48, uh, the thing that brings Nathaniel round to knowing Jesus isn't an intellectual discussion, but it's a personal encounter. Jesus has a sort of miraculous word of knowledge that he saw Nathaniel under a fig tree. Now, sitting under a fig tree perhaps has some sort of allusions to somebody who delves into the law. They might sort of like look through the scrolls sitting under a fig tree. Um, we don't know if that's the case, maybe. Um, but we don't know what Nathaniel was doing under the fig tree. He was, might have just been standing there and that's when Philip came to him or maybe something specific happened under the fig tree to Nathaniel, something emotional. Maybe Nathaniel was doing something naughty. Um, and, but whatever it was, it had this personal effect on Nathaniel. And we see it in all of the parables that Jesus shares about the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. That God is seeking you before you're seeking him. Jesus saw Nathanael even before Nathanael sought him. And I love that story of the prodigal son, the lost son in Luke 15. Um, it's one of my favorites. I probably squeeze it into as many sermons as I can. Um, but while it says... it. If you don't know the story, the son says to the father, it, it's as if you're dead to me. I want my inheritance now. And he leaves the father's household and he goes and he flaunts the money. He spends it on prostitutes and gambling and all sorts of things. And he ends up bankrupt. And he comes back, to, he starts to think, well, I might as well go back to the father, I suppose, and, and sort of be a slave for my father. He'll provide for me. Um, and yeah, I feel ashamed, but I'll just go back and I can just live as a servant servant now because I've lost my status. Um, and so he starts to turn. And as he is on his way back, it says this in verse 20, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The father was looking for the son. The son had decided that he'd messed up. But before that, the father was constantly looking out to see if the son was going to come home. And when he sees him on the horizon, he pulls up his robe. He ashames himself. It's something they wouldn't have done in those ages. He, he shows his knees and he runs to the son and he throws his arms around him, embraces him and says, come on back, come on home. I saw you before you sought me. And what I love about the prodigal son story is that there's an older brother that perhaps resonates in this, in, with this Nathaniel story. He's the cynic. He's the cynical one that sees the party and says, well, I've been slaving for you. I've had this issue for this long. And you know, you've not done anything for me. And I've not seen anything that, that, that means that I'm a son. I've just been a slave in your household. And he's he sort of, you know, throws a tantrum. He runs out of the party. And, and you know what? The father seeks him out too. He runs to him and he says, come back, come back into the household. You don't have to be the cynic. You can join the party. God is searching for you. He is not a theoretical idea that we have to wrap our heads around. Yes, we want to understand. And don't get me wrong, we have faith that seeks understanding. That's theology. But we, we, we might understand in theory who Jesus is, but there's a moment for every Christian where they know that Jesus is real, personally, in a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Because God is not an answer in a textbook. He's a person. And this is grace, that God is searching for you. You don't have to do anything. God knows each one of us. We don't have to work to get to Jesus. We don't have to sort of fill in the, the timesheet and spend this many hours doing this much work and going this far. Jesus stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks. We just have to let him in. He knows every person in Bristol, every single one outside of these walls. And he is moving, he is seeking them. 
for us as a church that plants churches, that wants to plant churches in this city, wouldn't it be amazing if every single person knew that, that God cared for them, for who they are, in whatever part of the city, not just those who can make it into the city centre, all these 20 people in front of me, um, but those all around in Bristol that, that would never be seen, seen in, this, in a building in the city centre. Those all around Bristol who need to know that God cares for them, seeks them out. And my third point this evening is that Jesus has made a way into God's presence. There's a, a weird line in verse 50 that you might not understand, and I must admit, I didn't know what was going on in it first as well. Um, but it says this, Jesus says, you will see greater things than that. Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What on earth does that mean? Maybe you know, that's, that's amazing. Kudos to you. But you know what? It's another link to Jacob. Uh, in, J in Genesis 28, uh, Jacob, he wrestles with God and he sees God in a dream and he has this vision of angels ascending and descending on this like ladder that joins heaven with earth at the place of Bethel, Bethel uh, the house of God. And he, you know what, he, he has this, this vision and it's like almost like God is going to be in this one geographical place. It's like a metaphysical link for in the sort of supernatural realm that's going to connect God and he's going to be in this one place. And it's a way for people to encounter God. Jacob has an encounter with God. And I don't think it's at all a coincidence that Jesus brings up this verse when Nathaniel encounters Jesus, he says, you are having an encounter with God. We will have a moment where his, the angels of God will be ascending and descending on the Son of Man. There will be a time when this sort of ladder is everywhere, where God's presence is with us through the Son of Man, through Jesus. And that we don't, we don't have to do anything for that. Jesus has already done it. He has made a way. In a moment, we're going to share communion. And um, in it, it's a meal where we celebrate and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us uh, to make a way for humanity to be restored with God, to have a, a, a connection with God, a relationship with God, that all the distance between us and God is removed through Jesus' death and resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul summarizes um, the, the sort of uh, what Jesus says at the table of the Last Supper, which is what we remember when we celebrate communion. And he says this, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every time we eat the bread and drink the wine, um, we remember the death of Jesus and his resurrection. We remember the pivotal point. All that those prophecies had been building towards were not a, a sort of a knight in shining armor on a, on, a, on a stallion to lead an army. They were leading to the cross. The cross is where Jesus takes all of our guilt, all of our shame, anything that we've done wrong, he holds it in himself and he surrenders it to God, sacrifices himself And through it, we are given the gift of eternal life. When we talk about the presence of God, at the moment that Jesus died on the cross, it's said that the, the temple veil was torn, a curtain that was in the temple to separate the sort of holy space where they believed that God was. He was sort of within the holy of holies in the, in the temple in Jerusalem. And there was this 
massive curtain, way bigger than ours um, and thicker than ours as well. It's almost inconceivable that it could be torn. But in that moment, it tears completely to, to symbolize and show us that it has, the barrier has been broken down. There is nothing that keeps us from God now because of what Jesus has done. And so for us, what would it look like if we as a church remembered Jesus' death daily, every time we eat, and every time we eat together and take communion, we remember the sacrifice that he made. That the cross means we don't have to live in guilt and shame. We are forgiven daily. What if we were a community that proclaimed that truth to others? You know, communion is kind of, it's, it's a symbol, it's a sacrament of who we are as the church, that we would gather together around this meal to remember this fact that we are forgiven through the death and resurrection of Jesus. See, in my story of knowing forgiveness, I felt that God was far off. But he wasn't, he was close And for every person who wants to eat this bread now, remember the truth that God died for you. He has forgiven you through his cross and resurrection. And we can live in his wonderful presence, knowing that we are forgiven and free because of what he's done for us. I'm gonna pray.